Hi there! Every time I work on a project that requires the use of a heatsink, people ask how do I know what kind of sides to use. There is nothing mysterious about that and it is actually relatively simple to figure out what you need for your project. In this video I will show you what to look for the determination of the heatsink size for your project and how to make a few simple calculations to select the right one, both in size and in shape. Let's begin! Let's start by listing the parameters we need to make the determination for the right heat sink. First, we need to take a look at certain parameters in the component datasheet. Let's look at some examples. Let's start with the 7812 voltage regulator. The table of the absolute maximum ratings give us the first set of information that we need. Look in particular to those entries that have entities representing temperatures. We have a parameter named TJ that provides the max temperature that the semiconductor junction inside the IC can withstand, in this case 150 degrees Celsius. The storage temperature gives us also another clue, the storage temperature range. The high end of this range provides an information similar to TJ, and we can use this in those cases where TJ is not directly provided. Table 7.3 provides us with a better choice for TJ, which is the recommended value during operating condition. See, this value is smaller than the previous one, and that is because the previous one is the maximum possible value, but nothing can be said for how long this maximum value can be sustained. The operating temperature instead gives us a temperature value that can be sustained indefinitely without damage to the component. The junction temperature is a very important reference value because all our calculations and estimations will have to guarantee that we never exceed such temperature or the device junction will practically melt. Going forward, we see this thermal information table this table contains the parameters that will help us to determine the right heat sink based on the power dissipated by the device that will not cause TJ to go beyond the maximum operating value. Among these parameters, the two most important are the junction to ambient thermal resistance and the junction to case thermal resistance. The thermal resistance is nothing else than the resistance offered by the materials to get rid of all the heat generated on the junction that is created by involved electric power. These parameters tell us how much the temperature increases for each watt consumed on the junction. Of course, to avoid high temperatures, we need to minimize this thermal resistance. Note how big is this value in the case of junction to ambient resistance. This is the case of the component with no heat sink at all, and for each watt it consumes, there will be an increase of 23 degrees Celsius at the junction. Of course, in this condition, it doesn't take much to reach the limit imposed by TJ. But now, look at the value of the junction to case resistance, only 3 degrees per watt. And this means that if we now use a heat sink capable of quickly dissipate all that heat using a low thermal resistance, and we attach the heat sink to the case of the component, we will prevent that huge increase in temperature that we would have without it. And that is because the thermal resistance of the component and the heat sink are such that they behave like simple resistors in series. They adapt, and if the sum was smaller than the junction to ambient resistance, we would have achieved a better heat dissipation. But wait, there is more. This particular component, since it is almost always used with a heat sink, is provided with a metallic pad where to attach the heat sink. Well, the junction to pad resistance is even smaller than the junction to case resistance, and that will help even more in keeping the temperature down. Let's now take a look at another datasheet, the one of the power MOSFET. This one can handle up to 25 amps, which suggests a high power working condition. And in fact, the next table tells us that this device could handle up to 60 watts. How much heat could be generated by that? 
and how much it could be the temperature increase. Well, here we see that the junction to ambient temperature is 62.5 degrees Celsius per watt, which means that the temperature at the junction could go up hundreds of degrees if we had to dissipate a 60 watt with no heat sink. Fortunately, we can use one, and if we did, the junction to case thermal resistance would be only 2.5 degrees Celsius per watt. What a difference! Besides, just above this table, we can see the value of Tj, the operating junction temperature, which has a maximum value of 175 degrees Celsius. It is a high temperature value, but this is a power MOSFET and it can handle it. So, now that you know about this kind of information on the datasheet, how do we use this data for the determination of a good heatsink? Well, it is time for a little theory, but not to worry, it is just a little and with almost nothing math involvement. Let's start with a simple diagram describing what we have already seen on the datasheets. Let's represent the semiconductor junction with a block J. The semiconductor is surrounded by the case, but in this diagram let's represent it with another block attached to the first, and let's call it C. At this point we either have the ambient, of which we don't care right now, or the heat sink attached to the case. Let's represent also the heat sink as a block, and let's label it S. Finally we have the ambient, which we also represent with another block called A attached to S. At each of the interfaces between these blocks we have a thermal resistance. First we call RJC the one between the junction and the case, which is the one we have already seen provided by the datasheets. Second, we have the thermal resistance between the case and the heat sink, which we call RCS. This resistance depends on the method of the user to mount the heat sink to the case. One way to do it is to mount the heat sink directly to the component. With this kind of method, the thermal resistance RCS is usually in the range between 1 and 1.3 degrees Celsius per watt. The second way to do it is to use some thermal compound, one of those spaces that we can spread in between the component and the heat sink to have a better transfer of heat between the two. In such case, the thermal resistance RCS is obviously lower, in the range between 0.5 and 0.8 degrees Celsius per watt. A third way to do it is to add in between the component and the heat sink an electric insulator like a thin sheet of mica. We do that in those cases where we mount on the same heat sink several components, and we need to keep them insulated between each other. In these cases, we normally add also the thermal paste to avoid increasing too much the thermal resistance. With both the mica and the compound, RCS is usually between 0.8 and 1.4 degrees Celsius per watt. The fact that we have ranges greater than the exact values depend on several factors, like the specific materials used, their thickness, the surface finishing between the parts, and the amount of pressure in the contact area. Unless we have the capability to measure the exact value for the specific case, I suggest to always go with the higher end of the range to stay on the safe side. Going back to the picture, the third thermal resistance that we need to consider is the one in between the heat sink and the ambient, which we call RSA. And this specifically is the one that we need to calculate so we can find in the data sheets the heat sink that better fits our needs. To do this calculation, we need to keep in mind that the various thermal resistances we have seen have a cumulative effect on the heat dissipation. In other words, they have to be considered like resistors in parallel, like this. And therefore, the total thermal resistance is the sum of the three we have seen, and let's call it RT. Per the definition of thermal resistance, this RT is the ratio between the temperature at the junction, or better, the difference between the temperature at the junction and the ambient, and the power consumed within the semiconductor junction. From this expression, we can calculate the needed RSA, which is simply given by the difference between the max junction temperature and the max ambient temperature, here called just Tj, divided by the power dissipated at the junction, Pd, 
minus two known thermal resistances RJC and RCS. This relation allows us to calculate the thermal resistance of the heat sink that we will have to look up in the heat sink datasheet. Let's now run an example which will help to consolidate all this procedure. I will assume we need to calculate the correct heat sink for a voltage regulator LM7805 that needs to provide a maximum current of 1.5 amps starting from a supplied voltage of 10 volt. Let's start by drawing the schematic with enough details so we can make our heat sink determination. So, we have a 7805 with capacitors on each side, of which we don't care about the value for our determination. We have an input voltage of 10V and an output voltage of 5V, providing a maximum of 1.5 amps. Let's start by calculating the power consumed by the 7805, which is given us by multiplying the voltage across the device and the maximum current it has to provide. We find that the LM7805 will need to dissipate 7.5 Watt of power. Looking at the component data sheet, we find that the thermal resistance between junction and case, RJC, is 3 degrees Celsius per Watt. The thermal resistance between case and heat sink using thermal compound, as we said already, is 0 0.8 degrees Celsius per Watt. And again, from the data sheet, the max operating junction temperature is 125 degrees Celsius. We will also consider an ambient temperature of 50 degrees Celsius, considering that the device will have to stay inside a container with limited airflow. At this point, we can use our formula to calculate the thermal resistance from the heat sink to ambient, which we will use to select the best heat sink for our project. The thermal resistance RSA will be equal to the difference between the junction temperature and the ambient divided by the power dissipation and reduced by the thermal resistance between junction and container and the thermal resistance between container and heat sink. Let's now replace the symbols with the known data. And we find that we need an RSA of 6.2 degrees Celsius per watt or less. Now we just need to go through the catalogs of our suppliers and find a heat sink that reflects this specification. And I have found this one that looks perfect for our needs, the Fisher Electronic SK409-50,8 STS. This heat sink, as you can see, has a plate on which the TO2020Ks of the LM7805 can be easily attached with a small nut and bolt. The component needs to be attached on the bottom side of the picture in such a way that the whole pad of the component touches the flat surface of the heat sink. And finally, we want to make sure to maximize the airflow. And since we know that hot air tends to go up, we want to mount this heat sink vertically so that the heat can easily slide toward the top of each of the lateral fins of the heat sink. Those two little prongs on the bottom are normally used to fit the heat sink to the PCB surface through two holes made for that purpose. If you don't have this kind of mount, the two prongs can be easily pulled out of the heat sink. And here you have it, a simple procedure to calculate the right heat sink for your project. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and found it useful for determining the right heat sink for your own projects. I'll see you in the next video, and in the meantime, happy experiments!